Welcome everyone. Thanks for joining this live event for our MicroMasters program in supply chain management. I think many of you know me, but my name is Alexis Bateman and I'm a research scientist at the MIT Center for Transportation and Logistics. And I'm also the director of MIT Sustainable Supply Chains. And today we're really fortunate to have Dr. Rez Agmani with us. He is the regional head of distribution and warehousing for Maersk. And he's also just an expert in logistics and supply chain manage management. He has a bachelor's, master's, and PhD from Assumption University in Thailand, and 20 years in logistics and supply chains. And, and for the last decade, he's worked with Damco and Maersk. And so he's going to bring some of his insights from, from that wealth of experience today. Uh, Ares, thank you so much for taking the time to join us today. Thank you very much, Alexis. Really appreciate and honored uh, to be here and to share some of, uh, of the insights that we can see in Maersk with the rest of the world. Yes, thank you so much. Uh, and and Arez is a, is a close friend of MIT CTO, so we're happy, happy to have him and share his expertise. Uh, so for the session we have, I'll just say briefly about our agenda. So um, Arez has a, just a small presentation that he'll start off with, 10, 15 minutes about some perspectives he has from Maersk. Uh, I have created some of my own questions that I would like to ask him that I think may be of interest and top of mind to many of you on the line. Um, and we'll run some polls also to see how you guys are experiencing during this very unprecedented time. And then we'll open it up for question and answer. So please start thinking about your questions as we're going along. Um, please use the webinar Q&A feature. That's where I'm gonna go through and be choosing and crowdsourcing some of the questions. Be sure to be logged in with a name. We're not gonna read any anonymous questions. So just make sure that you're logged in in that way. And so just make sure that you're, you're preparing those. We, I suspect, you know, uh, we will have many questions. So if we can't get through them all, I do apologize, but we'll try to as answer as many as we can uh, during the time available. So we just wanted to first get a general sense. We wanted to launch this first poll about what you see as causing volatil volatility in the supply chain. So I seeded in some answers. Uh, if you have other thoughts or perspectives. Um, I mean, clearly health pandemic is going to be one that is top of mind for all of us right now. But if you have other thoughts, please pop them into the chat. And so we can we can chat about that. So for now, for the next few minutes, I'm going to turn it over to a res and, and he's going to give us some insights he's learned over his time. Thank you, Alexis. I'm going to share my screen. I hope that uh, you can see the screen right now. Uh, so just kind of a, a brief introduction. So I'm, I'm as, as Alexis mentioned, I'm uh, looking after uh, the warehousing and distributions for, for Maersk for North America. Uh, I did a few different uh, roles uh, in the company. Uh, my previous role was uh, supply chain design and engineering. So we were looking after supply chain of large customers and, and finding solutions for them to improve it. And that kind of gave some insight to the work I'm doing today uh, and bringing uh, quite a better understanding of what is it that uh, we should do for our customers. So what I'm about to share is a little bit uh, an insight from uh, the way Maersk seeing things right now and definitely the Maersk perspective is coming from a global supply chain. It might be uh, slightly different if you're talking about uh, something local in the city or in the state or in the nation. Uh, so we are looking uh, from, from a supply chain. And Maersk is, is a company that exists uh, more than 100 years and reinvent itself uh, again and again uh, within the years, uh, bought different things and sell the different divisions. Uh, but today what we're basically doing is an end-to-end -end supply chain for customers. And that's allowing us to, to basically get and support uh, customers' requests. Uh, so we, we did ask uh, this poll question, um, what can cause uh, volatility in a supply chain and I can see the results here. I'm not sure if it's already shared uh, with everyone, but uh, basically I can see that health pandemics 
it's it's on the top of the list it's probably the most uh, fresh uh, things that we all remember so it's it's out there i can see that we're following it with uh, natural disasters uh, poor supply chain uh, coordination and limited supply chain visibility uh, definitely all correct and, and uh, right answers uh, but but of course there are much more than that uh, that can cause uh, disruption to supply chain so let me just kind of a uh, quick reminder to everybody and and i picked only the last 10 years really visible uh, things that happen into the supply chain. So if we take uh, 10 years ago, we had the volcanic ash cloud over Europe. Uh, in Iceland, uh, it was an eruption of, of uh, volcanic uh, that basically disrupted totally all the flights into Europe. That caused a huge uh, supply chain disruption. People that needed uh, to move goods fast uh, didn't have the ability to do it by air freight. And that's kind of created some uh, disruption uh, for the Europe continent. Uh, just a year after, in Japan, Fukushima meltdown um, basically created a supply chain. Uh, you might think, hey, how is it related to supply chain? But in, in that region, in that area of Japan, there is certain memory that has been produced and that's created some supply chain disruption, at least for the PCs and computers uh, and high-tech uh, industry. So, uh, and that's of course impact the rest of, of industries. Similar to that in Thailand at the end of uh, 2011 and the beginning of 2012, uh, we had the floods in Thailand that, that uh, and, and Thailand is the capital of the world in terms of hard disks. Uh, that's created a huge disruption in, into uh, the tech industries. A few years after that, 2014-15, uh, the worst cost uh, labor strikes that shut down uh, or, or slow down actually all the West Coast uh, ports uh, created a huge disruption uh, into uh, the way people looking to uh, uh, and building their supply chain. There was a lot of uh, slowdowns and, and people needed to take action and started to look around uh, in different ways. In 2017, MERSC was one of the impacted by the NotPetya's uh, virus. Uh, all our system went down within a day. Uh, no more IT system uh, to, to support the operation. And that was uh, MERSC as, as the largest uh, carrier in the world with about 20, 25% of the ocean. Uh, containerized logistic that's created a huge disruption in, in the market it was not only us of course it was many other companies but but only that uh, and the ports that related to that it's already was a, a huge disruption of course COVID-19 that uh, started the, the end of uh, 19 and it's it's we are in the middle of it right now that's creating and, and bringing the awareness of disruption uh, once again and, and with that in mind, you can see that, of course, it's pandemics, but it can be a human-made problem. It can be natural disasters. It can be labors, uh, availability and strikes. Uh, it can be IT failure and IT related, which is also kind of a man-made, right? Uh, so all that uh, definitely bringing us to kind of, uh, we need to get prepared. We need to be ready. If you're not ready, there is a huge potential for companies collapse, and, and I'm sure that some of the companies will not made uh, and will not survive this current disruption if they're not ready. Um, so in order to prepare basically, those kind of uh, unpredictable markets demand and, uh, and the volatility creates different needs uh, for supply chains. Uh, you can get requests from customers to get cargo much earlier in, in, in their supply chain or in, in their DC. You can get requests uh, that the warehouse is full. You need to actually change things. Uh, you can get requests, please bypass this uh, DCs and go directly to final customers or to the store. Uh, there is a lot of uh, different requests that that the uh, supply chain needs to be started to, to look into and, and become much more flexible than it used to be. You cannot just have a supply chain that is built on one set of rules 
and you don't have a backup to that. Uh, flexibility, speeding up, slowing down, it's definitely a key to sustain uh, uh, volatility in supply chain. Um, one of the things that can support such, uh, such design of network is a promise of an end-to-end -end lead time guaranteed. Uh, if you can see the slide here, uh, a normal transit time uh, from Asia to, to the US, for example, is normally something around from the moment it's ready at the factory until it's arrived to the DC, it's around the 40, 45 days, plus minus 13 to 15 days. This is a huge variation across the supply chain. It's very difficult to plan and decide things based on such a huge variation. Uh, a plus minus of 15 days means that a 30 days window, uh, your goods can arrive actually to, to the final destination. This is uh, almost a, a, unacceptable, but people le learn to live with that. Uh, in order to get out of this kind of uh, situation, ensure that you have much better uh, supply chain plans, uh, reduction of that lead time variation is, is definitely a key to the future of supply chain improvement and resiliency. Uh, ensuring that things coming on time when it's needed, this is basically uh, the way to do that. And, and the only way to do that is when you have uh, a visibility all the way of your supply chain, 100% visibility is crucial to have it. And you need a provider or, or support from providers that have an end-to-end -end, uh, capabilities to actually execute the supply chain as, as such. Uh, I can give you an example. Uh, if, for example, you need to come within certain amount of days from origin in Asia to uh, Memphis, DC, the easiest way to do it is, of course, coming to the West Coast and, 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 and enter over there and, and, of course, truck from there to Memphis, you arrive to the destination. But is it the right way to do that? Probably for certain times, but not always. You definitely need the flexibility to say, hey, now I don't want to go from the West Coast. I actually want to delay it. I'll come from the East Coast and I will enter from a different location. Or maybe I would first bring it into a, a, a DC or, or a warehouse that can actually store it for a while and act on it only when I need it. Or some places that can actually, a deconsolidation place that can actually give me the ability to go and distribute it to different uh, uh, destinations. So that can actually be a cross-dock uh, kind of capabilities. So definitely this one, it sounds an expensive kind of a proposition. I'm sure that uh, uh, you feel that, oh wow, with all this uh, flexibility, it definitely must uh, cost me more to run such a supply, a supply chain. Um, but my answer to that is not, not always. Uh, this is kind of just an example of an end-to-end -end, uh, reduction uh, of, of viability that uh, we worked with one of our customers. So you can see that originally it was about 40 days with a plus minus 13. So anywhere from 27 to 53 days that they can arrive to the destination uh, all the way from origin. Uh, we build a solution that is a 29 days plus minus three. So yes, in the origin solution, you can come at 27 days, you have a good chance to come very fast. Uh, but at the end of the day, uh, there is a lot of uncertainty when this will arrive, when cargo will be there. And that's creating a much more uh, inventory acquisition. And we basically starting to build more inventories in a warehouse which costing us definitely a lot of more uh, money. So reducing that inventory, uh, the safety stocks in our warehouses, basically help to actually reduce uh, the final uh, amount of money that we're spending on our supply chain. Uh, another quick example on that is, is, this is just I'm focusing and zooming in. Uh, I mentioned before warehouses at uh, uh, potential at the destination. So what you see here is an example of a normal regular solution where uh, cargo arrives at the port of uh, these cases in LA 
Uh, it is been uh, basically goes to the final port, the inland port, for example, if we're talking back to the Memphis. So there is another uh, move of the 40 foot containers goes to the uh, surrounding of Maersk, uh, of Memphis. And then from there you have another provider come and take this 40 and bring it to, to the final. Here it's actually uh, Fort Worth Dallas, but uh, so it doesn't matter where the destination is. It's, it's, there is uh, multiple handovers and your 40 foot container is, is keep moving around. Uh, and actually this is the one that, that uh, moving to the final destination. So there is, because of the multi vendors and multi handoffs, uh, the transit time from arrival to the port all the way to destination is something between six to 10 days. Um, something that uh, you have a variation, the cost of that is actually more expensive. Uh, an alternative to that is basically you're taking it into a, a, a warehouse located very close to the port. You convert the 40s into 53 trailers. You can save on the environment impact. You can save on the movements of uh, 53s that actually move to your destination. And you can create much better uh, accuracy of the transit time. And we can see in this example that we have eight to nine days so yes, it could be, it is still higher than the six to the six days that we have in the original example, but the, it's, it's definitely much more accurate and you can plan much better around this. And of course, at the end of the day, it's also creates some cost reduction to the customer here in this case is $300 uh, saving. So yes, it sounds more expensive to have flexibility and solutions, but there are ways to actually uh, go around it and, and create some kind of uh, measurement to actually that uh, help you to save. So having all those type of uh, preparation definitely help, uh, but it's not all. Uh, you need to build solution in advance. You need to build ways to be flexible, uh, but you also need to kind of things, what alternative do I have for certain things that I'm depending on? And, and as I mentioned before, one of the, uh, things that can create some uh, disruptions, it's, it's actually the human being. Uh, we have shortage of human being work, willing to work in, in the certain environments. And uh, I, I'm not thinking that people will disappear from warehouse anytime soon, but definitely we need to have alternatives and we need to have certain uh, potential ideas. So just this is, a, I'm gonna show a quick video of uh, just certain things that we are working on. Uh, this is in one of our uh, facilities that we're working. I don't know if you're noticing, but there is no driver in, in, in the driver's seat. Uh, this is an autonomous vehicle uh, that we are testing basically uh, in, in the yard. And the idea of that is to create another set of uh, pool. For example, uh, in the middle of the night when people uh, do not prefer to work uh, in those shifts, we can actually uh, rearrange all the containers in the yard and bring them into the right position that we can actually work early in the morning when people arrive. So that's definitely uh, something that can help us uh, uh, to get better, uh, better when, when people are not there. So, uh, another uh, solution that we're exploring right now, it's container unloading. So what you're gonna see here in this video is basically a machine and there are different type of machines that uh, that doing that today, going inside the container and starting to unload uh, cartons and, and bringing them to, to a conveyor that wait behind that and start to sort uh, where the cartons needs to go. So yeah, I'm calling this machine the cookie monster. Uh, it's, it sounds like it's, it's going inside and eating the boxes uh, with suctions and with other kind of equipments that bringing it basically uh, in a much faster speed uh, than, than we could do manually. So, so definitely we need those kind of uh, innovational approach to look into, uh, into different solution and different things that uh, we're working on. Um, but uh, but it's, not, uh, it's not something that it's easy to build, but definitely needed to be built. Uh, beside the automation, of course, any company that would like to be ready for uh, such a disruption or, or such a volatile, volatile uh, time need to build a business continuity process. 
And this is what I'm sharing with you is basically the way we are working in Maersk uh, based on. And uh, when all those recent uh, things that happen and, and disrupt us uh, in the last few years, basically made us create such plans and, and make sure that we execute it immediately when, when things happening. So, uh, so definitely the initial action that you can see here is the emergency response. Uh, the number one is, is to sh ensure that safety of people is, is the number one priority. Definitely it's, it's, uh, it's above everything else. And then you have safety of infrastructure. That's the second thing. If your infrastructure is still available, accessible, that's definitely help you to be able to, uh, to work on solution and create solutions. Um, of course, there could be times that infrastructure goes under, under the water, for example, literally in Thailand, the floods or, or other uh, different things that you just can't access those infrastructure. Then you need to have some continuity planning uh, where you're going to move people, will they work from home, will they work from a different location. Uh, so the crisis management is, is, is the next basically uh, things that uh, can create, that needs to be uh, executed. Uh, structure training crisis management team needs to be in place and needs to be the one that's handing everything. Uh, we call it the war room basically. Uh, people that are capable to give uh, the, the right communication uh, and ensure that both internal and external communication are going as flows because as we talked before visibility is different definitely a key uh, to ensure that we are able to move ensuring that people getting one source of information and correct source of information it's a very crucial to success uh, in, in managing any crisis uh, and then at the end of, uh, of after this uh, initial plans, uh, the business continuity planning needs to take over and, and creating a, a business risk assessment, uh, ensuring that uh, all the offices, we have documentation of what you do, how you do things, uh, what is happening with the operation, who is doing what, um, how you can handle locations that basically you need to close. For example, what happened if you have somebody in, infected with the coronavirus in your facility, what is it that you're doing, how you return to normal operation and making sure that the operation is, is uh, really uh, capable to do that. Uh, of course, the process needs to be, uh, be planned uh, with the business continuing plan uh, planning. Uh, you need to document and ensure that uh, you have the right infrastructure. People knows how to do things, even they are not in the office. Uh, IT needs to be supported. Uh, the first few days of, of this uh, coronavirus, we saw that our IT bandwidth started to get heated by all these conference calls and video calls. Uh, that's definitely something that you need to be ready with. Okay, execute the plan. Took about two days to execute the plans and, and we're back to normal operation that people could actually do all those video conferences and video calls uh, over the internet uh, without disruption. So, uh, that is definitely one of the key things in order for us to, to success in, in, in mitigating those kind of uh, situations. That's basically all what I wanted to share in terms of slides. Uh, I definitely will looking forward to, uh, to, to get some questions, both from Alexis and, and from you uh, people. Great, thank you so much, Rez. That was really insightful, really interesting, and brought some good perspectives. So I can see the, the Q&A blowing up right now, but uh, it, I'll start with a few of mine, and then um, we'll go to, to our learner um, uh, uh, question. So I'm just gonna release one poll to gauge actually um, some of what you guys are doing, what your companies are doing in response um uh to the coronavirus impact and some of the strategies that are being employed so we can gauge some of that but um so you know in the visual you just showed you had this timeline of you know the initial you know crisis response and then the emergency management and then to like a business continuity plan my question is how do we deal with this when it's such an extended you know extended situation where it's gonna you know it's not a few days long it's not a few weeks long it's gonna be months long to a year long how do you how do you see Maris responding in that way and in general any suggestions you have for those on the line yeah 
so, so definitely the number one thing, as I, as I mentioned, is definitely ensuring the safety of the people, both our own employees and, and the people around and everybody in the community. So that's the number one priority that we, we have to take care. Uh, the second thing is, is communication. We have to build uh, some communication methods and skills uh, that ensure that the visibility kept going and, and people understand what is it uh, that's happening, both internally and with customers and with suppliers. Uh, the whole chain needs to be uh, communicated constantly, even daily or multiple times a day. It's, it's really crucial to ensure that people get those kind of uh, information. Uh, definitely, if it's becoming an extended impact and situation, I, I do suggest, and I think that we are also taking the same approach, is delay unnecessarily project. You will need a, a cash very soon. Things will change. And, and in order to free cash, any unnecessary project, delay it or stop it for now. If, if it's, a, it's a project that's super important to uh, your survival, continue it, of course, but any other things, uh, put on hold if you can. Uh, one of the things that uh, we see with our customers is that the, the feedback that we get from them is that they're really happy that uh, they're working with a logistic provider that can give them the flexibility uh, and the solution on the end-to-end. -end. So alternative uh, routing, alternative solution, different ways to do things and, and make sure. And I think one of the important things to remember is don't panic. When we, we're talking about don't panic in terms of supply and demand, if you remember, everybody learned about and, and probably played uh, about the bullwhip effect. Uh, we need to remember the beer game. We need to remember all this kind of fun that we did. When it's reached to a point that uh, we're starting to react with no control, we're creating a huge uh, supply chains. Uh, effect and demand and and that's definitely something that needs to be kind of been taught and planned and see do i do it because i'm panicked or do i do it because this is the right thing to do so i know it's not it's easier say than done but it's definitely something important to keep in mind when we, we work on that absolutely um so just to follow up on that one real quick in terms of you know the clear open line of communication you know keeping that constant line of communication to keep things flowing to keep people not panicked do you see communication shifting at all right now sort of in real time as people are unable to meet in person as they would you know in, in other settings yeah i definitely see communication are, are flowing and, and changing nowadays uh, we start to see a lot of different styles of communication than, than in the past uh, a lot of uh, in-person meetings that could not take place are, are moving to become online. And, and I feel that in the last year uh, or two years even, visibility and communication real time was much more important for people in the supply chain. And I think after this one, it will become even more important than that. You will see that people are getting extremely uh, interested to have online visibility and communication of what's going on, where's my things, uh, what will happen next for, for my goods. Absolutely, thanks. Uh, so for those that haven't filled out the poll, fill it out real quick and we can discuss um, uh, some of your guys' thoughts there. Um, so here's a key question. Supply chains were largely invisible to the lay audience, to the public, to, to many people. And now they're in, the, they're in the limelight. We're seeing the critical role of supply chains. Can you talk a little bit about what you think the role of emerging, obviously ongoing, but emerging role of the supply chain professional will be with this new kind of focus on the supply chain and your thoughts there? Yeah, I think it's, it's definitely uh, the case that supply chain is kind of in the background always. But I think more and more people in the last few years realize that supply chain is basically what moved the world, right? Uh, if, if supply chain will not be declared as, as a, a critical role to continue operation, we'll have riots in the streets because people will not have their goods or their toilet paper, right? <laughs> we see people <laughs> going after that. So, so definitely the experts in supply chain uh, have a lot to offer. Uh, but what I would like to say also is that remember that experts, it's always great and they do great thing when we're talking about things that already happen. 
You become an expert about things that already happened. You're not an expert about the future. So besides the historical knowledge that you learn from things that happened, definitely we need to add a vision on top of that. What could happen next? What could change? So, so the role of, of supply chain is, is also to start to simulate scenarios and cases that, that never happened before. And, and we start to see it more and more when we talk to uh, large customers. They want to understand what if this is going to happen and what if that's going to happen. And this is where we're starting to add the expertise and the knowledge of different people. And that's kind of giving us a broader picture that, that ensure that we have uh, the flexibility and, and the ability to get out of certain situations. Uh, so I do advise people to keep search and explore for alternative uh, out of the box thinking what else can be done and ensure that uh, the business continuum plan is exist it's 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 a crucial to have it uh, and make sure that you and your provider have those kind of uh, planning around great oh thanks uh so let's see we have some preliminary results i think we're having a few technical difficulties with our polls but we will use what we got. So um, top uh, ways that your company organization are reacting to coronavirus, uh, number one being shifting work to rotating or minimizing on-site staff, creating a customer product priority plan, uh, also very high managing a clear line of communication, uh, emergency management center, and uh, postponement strategies. So some interesting results there. I can leave those up there for a second. Uh, so another question, um, and, and I, I can see a, quite a few people wanting to ask you questions. So I'll just do one more and then we'll open it up. But what are, so we're learning a lot right now, right? And we're gonna continue to learn a lot as, as this impact is continuing globally and impacting our supply chains. Are there things, and I, you've alluded to these, but maybe pinpointing them, some future-oriented practices that companies can think about now to internalize as we, internal, as we enter a period of recovery? And you know, knowing that even though hopefully nothing like COVID-19 will hit us again in a long, long time to be prepared in these situations. So any perspectives about those practices moving to recovery and, and onward? Yeah, so uh, I think, I think uh, it's, there's a lot for us to do, uh, to build for the future, to be ready. Uh, one of the things will be to build a cross-functional team uh, from senior management and experts in different fields, uh, just to be sure that we are, ad we are addressing all the supply chain risks uh, and we're preparing for them. Uh, we call it war room in the bigger scale and, and uh, in, when we talk about different locations, we call it cockpit uh, just for it's, it's a much more uh, condensed to certain areas. So definitely that's kind of uh, an important thing uh, to, to do and to plan for. A decision that you make, definitely make those decisions to protect the bottom line, not the procurement cost. A lot of the time when people make decisions in the supply chain, it's just the temporary procurement cost. They would like to reduce uh, certain uh, cost here or there, and, and they make some decision based on that. I will challenge you guys to look and think about the bigger picture, the bottom line, and, and protect that one. Uh, definitely, uh, this is important. Uh, another, part, another point is, is definitely to develop a supply chain visibility. Uh, without the visibility, you cannot take action. You are basically goes in the dark, and we see that uh, in certain companies that do not have the visibility, they have no clue where is the cargo is, where is the PO is. Uh, when it will hit this location or that location. So in order to actually have actions, you need to have the visibility. So that's definitely something to be prepared for. Uh, use more uh, integrated uh, supply chain providers. Uh, as I mentioned before, it helped with the flexibility, uh, the visibility and the reduce the time to market. Uh, of course, if you can consider multi-country sourcing or, or different locations to be sourced from. Not always easy, uh, but, but definitely something important to think of. I don't think you can just get rid of one country or another. This is, uh, the world is really complex and, and tied into each other in those kind of things. So, so consider more locations. Uh, and definitely request your supply chain providers to share their plans uh, to, for disruption time. So if they have any plans, 
uh, that's definitely need to be shared so you can actually work together to come up with, with solutions for that. This is great, thank you. Um, so I think we'll, we'll launch one, uh, one more survey. Hopefully we can get it so that everyone can see it. Um, and then we have a very long list of questions. So I'm looking through to, to grab a couple. Um, <laughs> one question from Amanda is, is the Cookie Monster uh, also available for pallets? Have you seen anything along that line? So yeah, I saw solutions that are available for pallets. It's not exactly the way the Cookie Monster work, but it's going to be, I don't know, a mini Cookie Monster. There are solutions to unload uh, pallets from containers uh, automatically and bring them into, uh, into whatever you need in the back. So yes, there are. So it's the Cookie Monster is uh, around. Uh, so on that same, I'm just going to answer or ask the same uh, related question, Carmen, right after people are very interested in the Cookie Monster, which is, is there, is the Cookie Monster doing damage to the packages, cartons that are moving through? Uh, so, so the testing that uh, we are looking after, the, we, we looked at different type of machine. I show you only one uh, in the video. Um, so the there is basically so far was no damage or, or less than 1% of damage in the one that we tested. Uh, we are testing a different one right now that is basically zero damage. It's, it's moving as fast as, uh, as the Cookie Monster, but, but in a different, uh, uh, different way. And that's definitely zero, zero damage for now. Great, thanks. Uh, so Crystal asks, um, what do you see about the trend for, and we're gonna try not to get too political here, but uh, deglobalization. So, you know, there's obviously a lot of very political examples, US building a wall against Mexico, England out of you. Is there a trend for dual supply chains to cope with these global trends and, and your perspectives on that? Uh, definitely it will impact uh, the supply chain. Prices will change. People will have to rethink where they're sourcing their goods from. Uh, but that's bring us back to the idea of let's create more than one locations that we are sourcing because uh, if, even if we want it or not, we cannot just eliminate China or eliminate uh, Mexico, or eliminate somewhere else around the supply chain. There is gonna be always a need, both from supply and from demand to keep working with the whole work. I know that there is a lot of different voices nowadays that we need to definitely look at our own people first. Uh, but sooner or later, people will see that you have to keep this kind of uh, uh, the way, if we want to keep the way of living that we live today and, and all the accessibility that we have to products, we definitely will have to keep uh, the ability to work globally rather than just locally. Right, thanks. Um, so we asked the survey about um, how has dealing with coronavirus impacted your daily duties significantly? So we asked the same question in a different session a little less than a month ago, uh, and only about 20% said that they were being impacted today. Almost 70% said, yes, obviously a lot. You're being, your daily duties are impacted significantly. 28% um, said yes, a little. And then I'm interested in the 5% that said no or 2% no, but it will soon. So, uh, oh, I didn't even share the results. Sorry about that. So I'll share those results just for your reference. Um, so then we have a, a good question from, from Sumia. Uh, he, they, they're asking, um, you know, talking about this, you know, end-to-end -end communication and visibility. How does Maersk incentivize supply chain partners to share data to, end, to aid in that, um, that supply chain visibility, especially now? I think the best way to incentivize people that can share data is to give them data back. And this is one of the approach that uh, we are taking is uh, the more we are demanding, people want some data back and they need to use it for their own uh, reasons and, and services. So that's kind of the best way uh, to do that. Uh, we have to also remember that a lot of the data that we have is actually generated from within the company uh, because we own both supply chain management so we have all the information from our customers on the PO level we're helping with the vendor management we have that information 
we have we have the ports uh, with the APM terminal ports. We have the vessels themselves. So many different type of information is already coming uh, within uh, the company itself. Of course, there's it's it's uh, limited for our own uh, kind of uh, capabilities. So when we need air freight type of information or other carrier information or trucks information, definitely not the number one is give and take. Uh, and, and the second one is, of course, you pay per use uh, when needed. But uh, that's kind of a secondary to, to people that only like to give and they don't have a need for that. Right. Right. Thanks. Uh, so now this one's going to really press our, our, our brains here, which is we have this ongoing crisis with COVID-19. And now in Southeast U.S., we'll soon have a hurricane on top of the COVID situation do, does crisis response or, or planning take into account multi, multiple emergency events at one time? And what are your thoughts on that? Uh, definitely multiple things uh, needs to, to maneuver and take care at the same time. Um, I think it will uh, impact the way we work and, and it's going to create us uh, look at things in a different way. Uh, the way we are handling that is, is as I mentioned before, is uh, having a war room plus cockpits in, in the different uh, uh, sections within the company uh, to ensure the flow of information and flow and communications is coming and going from, from the different uh, angles of, of the business that is, is moving around. Right. Um, so Musas asks, are you seeing a difference in how companies are moving their goods during this time period, whether that be different precautions, different uh, modes, you know, and, and you know, the, the timelines, are there, are, are there certain trends you're seeing there? Oh, definitely. Definitely. <laughs> there is a huge change, 180 degree change of the way people used to do things uh, until a month ago and how they're moving today. Uh, the number one thing that we see is a huge uh, request for air freight and charter, uh, air charters uh, operations. Uh, uh, this is for everything that needs to be done uh, fast uh, for all the medical support and, and uh, uh, sanitary equipment, etc., etc. is today moving by air freight. So there's no ocean involved in that. There is, but the number one thing is going by air freight. So, so huge uh, constraint. And, and remember that most of the capacity in the air freight world is in passenger aircraft. Uh, I, I would estimate it to be 60, 70% of the world's capacity is actually in, uh, in the belly of passenger aircrafts. When those aircrafts are not moving, we are moving to charters. And there is a certain amount of charters or freighters available in the market. So we see airlines that are taking the seats out of the passenger or other airlines that putting cargos on top of the seat and, and putting nets. So that's number one thing that's uh, happening. Uh, it's, it's actually, uh, we see a lot of air freight. Uh, when we're talking about, about oceans, there is a definitely a lot of uh, changes as well. Uh, a lot of the distribution centers are full and closed. Uh, and they cannot take more cargo anymore because all the stores are closed and there is no release from the DC. So people are looking for uh, store containers for us. Uh, can you reroute it via different locations so it will arrive later than before? So cargo that used to go into the West Coast now being requested, please route it into the East Coast. Get, let gain another uh, 10 to two weeks uh, time on the water so we don't need to find solution for that. And by then, hopefully, things will change. Uh, people are asking uh, to, they want to reduce the detention, the marriage on the containers. So they're asking for solution to get off cargo and put it in temporary storage in warehouses. Uh, we get uh, different requests of, uh, can you now break the cargo, take only the emergency goods or the things that needs to be used for emergency, bring them to the, the, the final destination and the rest you hold for now. So there is multiple different requests nowadays uh, to change supply chains of, of the customers. Right, no, super interesting. I'm thinking about all the different changes going on right now. Um, so David uh, asks, uh, well, first, thanks to you for your presentation and, and answering so many questions. Uh, he says he'd like to know more about strategies for increasing flexibility. Is, is Maersk making agreements with third parties for increasing capacity or is that managed internally? Any additional advice related to flexibility? Uh, so, so 
The simple answer on, in terms of do we do uh, capacity management with others, the answer is yes, right? Uh, there is alliances in the world today and, and definitely each carrier has backups, including MERSC with other carriers in, in increasing capacity. Uh, but the main flexibility is not coming uh, just because of you get more capacity. A lot of the time, actually, the carriers would like to reduce capacity because it's impacting. Uh, you cannot operate a capacity if it's not bringing a certain amount of income because otherwise you're actually losing money for every voyage. So there is a lot of times that you actually reduce capacity just to maintain certain rates. Uh, but the, the real potential thing in order to create uh, flexibility is to be able to have your own capacity and control of every element in the supply chain. So if, for example, the ocean port to port is being slowed down because of whatever reason, and there is always a, something can happen. You cannot create a bulletproof uh, uh, point to point supply chain. You can create a much better resilience end to end supply chain by be, a, be able to actually control everything in the supply chain and mitigate those problems along the way. So if you have all the end-to-end -end, uh, capabilities and you have the ocean portion is actually being delayed right now or uh, alternatively arrive earlier, you can actually uh, slow down or speed up uh, when you move things through the warehouse or through the trucking or through... Uh, so that's basically the way we're creating uh, flexibility. And on top of that, you have to have uh, the visibility. As I repeatedly again, uh, Visibility is the, is the key for everything. Without that, you cannot do smooth handover. You cannot control end to end. You cannot create some flexibility. Right. No. Thanks for that. Uh, so we'll we'll launch our our last poll. Um, so we're just going to for this one. I want you to think about how this is actually going to change how your company operates its supply chain uh, in the future. So, and you can select one more than one solution. We'll, we'll launch that. Um, and then uh, we can discuss those, those results uh, shortly. Let me get that going make sure hopefully everyone will see it. Um, okay. So then we'll go to, and again, um, so for your reference, there is, there's 122 questions remaining. So we're going to try to get to what I, we can in the next 13 minutes, but um, excellent, excellent questions. Really, really good. And, and, and thank you, Erez, for, for diligently answering so many. Um, so we, one question from Owen, which is interesting, is, um, and we saw some issue with our own US government misspeaking about this, which is, do travel restrictions of any countries how are they affecting cargo logistics? Uh, so, so far we did not see any restrictions in movement of cargo. Uh, cargo do continue to flow between the countries. Uh, that's not really happening right now. Some countries uh, wanted to kind of uh, get a better visibility of where it's coming from, what is happening along the way, but, but that's something that uh, is happening in the last few years anyway. Uh, so I don't see any different, uh, any, any similar uh, impact like happening to the people right now. Okay, great. Um, so a question which I think you alluded to a little bit, but, but Catherine asked directly, which is, do you have a, a prioritization or classification that Mayor, excuse me, prioritizes humanitarian cargo? And how, how do you deal with that? Yes, definitely. We have a, a government and, and aid a section within the company that supports uh, FEMA and all the other kind of uh, uh, global organization that definitely get uh, number one priority uh, for this type of uh, equipments and goods that needs to, uh, uh, to support uh, the life of people. So uh, aid and relief is, is uh, core uh, things that MERSC take on itself uh, to promote and, and ensure that uh, supporting. So we are prioritizing. Okay. Great. So we have some some interesting questions I wasn't expecting, but ones to think about, which are, do you have any thoughts about the sharing economy opportunities in, 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 in uh, transportation logistics and how that's going to be impacted now and in the future? Uh, the sharing economy. So I, I think I think it's uh, definitely an, an interesting way to do things, right? Uh, and making sure that uh, you have true applications and IT system 
uh, ability to give locations and, and services that you have in certain locations. Uh, of course, it is not easy nowadays to, for example, you don't see the Amazon uh, local movers are coming as often as before or any other. Uh, there is a lot of restriction to that when you have to have your own capacity and, and vehicle or storage. Uh, but I, I do believe that this is uh, something in the future that will, will grow uh, based on certain things like we see today. Great. Um, Jose, or excuse me, Jose now asks, um, could you say something about the current shipping container shortage? Uh, yes, uh, so definitely a lot of the cargo is, as I mentioned before, is being stored in containers nowadays. Uh, people are asking uh, to find solution for the yard, uh, yard solutions for their containers because the containers uh, cannot be unloaded into the DCs and warehouses. Uh, and that's definitely creating a shortage, especially in the center of the countries, out of the ports area, uh, and impacting uh, the ability to uh, move containers into the location. Uh, certain companies that need those containers for exports, uh, we see them willing to pay money to move empty containers from the ports into the inland uh, portions of the country. Uh, certainly something that you don't see in normal days. Normal days they are taking advantage of the empty containers uh, being in those places. Uh, but nowadays when you have a shortage, people get creative and, and finding solution to, to get that. But, but the more cargo will be stuck inside containers, the more we'll see shortage with that. Uh, and, and we'll have to find alternative solutions. One of the way could be to move things in the 53 uh, trailers, bring them into the port if you need to export, and basically convert it back to 40s in the port area. That could be an, an alternative solution that we're working with some of our customers nowadays. Right. Oh, thanks for that. Uh, so another question for Soren is asking about uh, oil prices right now and the fluctuation. Uh, how is that impacting, you know, Maersk's strategy is in, in any way? Uh, so I'm, I'm not an oil expert, but uh, I know that uh, the way we're dealing with oil is based on, on the market demand and, and supply. Uh, we're not bankering any oil or fuel in advance because then it's becoming more of a, we're not hedging uh, fuel uh, because that's kind of uh, becoming more of a gambling exercise uh, to understand. So uh, it's definitely impacting us when the fuel uh, going up uh, or when it's go downs, we, we take and, and push back this uh, up and downs uh, with the customers and we work with them to, to ensure this is uh, sustainable to all. Right. Um, so I'm just going to share the results from the, our, this poll that we ran. So the question was, um, do you think uh, this disruption is going to change how your company operates and supply chain in the future? So by and large, the um, greatest, uh, most significant answer was having greater risk management protocols in place. And so I think that that's a, it's a good one. Definitely very key here and, and one that Erez touched on several times. More visibility to deeper tier suppliers. So I think that that's uh, been clear theme here as well. Uh, potentially, which I think maybe we can talk a little bit about this after this, which is more local domestic sourcing. So thinking about how that's going to shift as global supply chains are disrupted and as well as diversifying suppliers, digitally enhanced supply chains. Uh, so those are the, the top answers, uh, along with um, greater focus on, on supply chain so that, uh, you know, supply chain will, will come into uh, more focus. So um, just on sort of the one question I have seen generally, but, you know, personally, I wanted to ask as well is, um, what do you think about potential shift to domestic sourcing? I think we touched on that with sort of the global supply chain shift and more kind of national focus, but, you know, strategically, how do you see that changing in the near future? Uh, just before I jump into answering that, I'm, I'm interested to, uh, with the results of the poll. So having oh, a great risk management protocol in place, uh, definitely a great things to be on the top of the list. But I just want to cautious people that normally when things comes down and everything goes to normal, people forget about it. So uh, definitely do not forget about it. Give it the priority uh, because as, as I presented uh, in one of the slides, 
in the last 10 years, we repeatedly have uh, different disruptions, maybe not in this magnitude that the whole world is shut down, but, but there are constantly things that uh, disruption, disrupting our supply chain. And, and when it happens, people, yeah, we need to do that, we need to do that. And then the moment it's over, yeah, let's go back to normal, we forget about this. So, so definitely uh, encourage you to work on that, make sure that you have this protocol in place and you actually refresh them within time and, and checking that they're still valid and workable. Uh, now, just talking about the domestic, definitely some of the things will move uh, to domestic uh, distribution. Um, but of course, you cannot do that across the board. Uh, price of, of the goods is still a crucial and important thing. And you can't just manufacture things at the same price level that you can do it in certain other parts of the world. It won't work. 3D printing is, is something that we see more and more coming into play and, and uh, definitely in the future will come even more and certain goods or spare parts or, or certain things will be able to be done locally with, with the 3D printing and in a reduced cost in, in a much faster environment. But, but it's still far away from being everything going to be done domestically. That's, uh, that's I believe, it's not going to happen anytime in, in our days uh, anytime soon that's at least my view on that yeah oh, great um and uh i think your advice on you know th those organizations that have very robust risk management protocols in place are ones that revisit them and set them in place and have to kind of refresh, you know, frequently, not let them fall by the wayside. And uh, as a plug for the current course that many of you guys are in, SC3X Supply Chain Dynamics, recognizing the opportunity for running things like scenario planning, thinking about these type of impacts and different tools you can employ to start thinking about those and, and, and you know, critical planning in these cases of disruption. Um, so Carlos, so I'll just, I just have a few more in our last um, four minutes of this session. Uh, Carlos asked, do you think uh, this global situation will create new business models for the supply chain? Yeah, I'm sure it will. I'm sure it will. Uh, as, as we spoke before, people are looking for different uh, ways to, to move the cargo. I think uh, at least the way we see it internally, one of the key things to enable uh, companies is is the end-to-end -end supply chain guarantee of, of transit time or, or reduction of variation, uh, because that can answer many of the ways, uh, many of the problems or potential problems. It can help the normal demand and, and supply of, of customers. It can help during a crisis time. It can help during a, a, any day that you would like to actually uh, reduce the money that uh, tied into inventory, so, so there is more and more things that I feel people would look into end-to-end -end capabilities rather than uh, sectionals uh, suppliers. So uh, I saw that one of the answers were diversifying suppliers. Yes, I definitely agree that this is important, but I will also think that we will see more people going into uh, an end-to-end -end capabilities from, from suppliers and not just let's break it into many small pieces and, and look into the, the immediate uh, procurement. Uh, so that's definitely will, will change the, the way we look at supply chain after. Right, absolutely. Um, so Rui asks, and I think this may be our last question before we have a final sign off. Uh, in, and it's related to what we just talked about, which is in Maersk, is there a team or any individuals fully allocated to emergency response crisis management? Oh yes, definitely. There is a team uh, that dedicated to that. Uh, we have uh, the protocol of these people are not sitting idle the, year, the whole year round. They are coming from the different businesses and they are part of, of a, a disaster uh, recovery team. Uh, and the moment that something goes on, basically we initiate this team and bringing them back to the war room and ensure that uh, there is an execution of the plan that we, we set in place. So those teams are fully aware what they're supposed to do. They're part of uh, regular discussions uh, and building up the, the recovery plan uh, during the year. So yes, the answer is definitely yes. Great, thanks. Uh, so we're coming to the end of this awesome session. I just want to thank you so much, Rez, for taking your time. I know you are managing a million things right now, so I really 
thank you for taking the time to talk to our learners and really give your experience and having gone through different events you know that we can learn from um, also thank you to all the learners um, joining today from and you know we're fortunate to have these kind of sessions so please you know continue to join and and share on this is openly available so you can share to anyone who might benefit um, final final question any words of wisdom as we sign off to for those that are you know, feeling a little bit stressed in these uncertain times. <clears throat> hey, I can only offer wisdom in, in supply chain. <laughs> Definitely see, see the bright side of things. Uh, uh, supply chain is being disrupted, but uh, it, it shows that it's necessary to plan and so necessary to build things. So uh, people that might be impacted uh, in the short term in, in terms of work, I believe that you definitely gonna find yourself in, in a good situation after it's all over, when, when more and more company will want to have those expertise and capabilities in place. So, so definitely uh, uh, remember that uh, and, and keep, keep doing the good stuff that, that you're doing because I think people that are in the supply chain are the number one crucial to make sure things are moving and, and flowing. So, so definitely a good job for everyone that's involved in supply chain. Thank you so much, Reza. Those were great words of wisdom to sign off by. Thank you and everyone stay safe and healthy. Thank you guys.